All right, this is the uh, first case that uh, Judy has shared with us, and it relates to a, an accessory bronchus. So take a look at, let me first get you to more usual left upper lobe bronchus here, and then coming off right here is another small bronchus, and it goes there. So I'm not sure if I've seen that before, other, and other than describing it as an accessory, an accessory bronchus related to the left upper lobe, I'm not sure what to call that. It's beneath the pulmonary artery, so it's hip arterial in location. But I'm not sure I've recalled seeing one quite like that. And if anyone knows that it has a name or any other significance, so, Howard, I've seen a variant very similar to this a couple of times, um, and it's often associated with an abnormal fissure, um, but I've seen them called in the, some of the older literature as a left tracheal bronchus, which clearly it isn't because it doesn't arise from the trachea, and I think that explains why sometimes you hear about, you know, they talk about the tracheal bronchus usually occurs on the right, because I don't know if anyone's ever seen a true left tracheal bronchus. Yeah. What is the rest of the branching pattern on the left upper lobe? Let's see, is you know this this bronchus seems to have an yeah, I'm not even sure if there's a an apical. Yeah, it almost looks apical. like it's just the apical segment, maybe, because it you have anterior and posterior segments there, and then it's the lingula coming off anteriorly. And the in the uh, in let's see. Well, the lingula comes off down here. I haven't, had, I haven't spent much time looking at it closely to see whether it's replacing something like an apical, an apical segment. I'm not entirely sure, Travis. I can't make uh, sagittal and coronal reformats with this data set, so. It does look like the apical segment bronchus. Can you make a coronal right now or is it um no i can't with this data set i can't it won't let me do that these are kind of uh jpeg type images or yeah something like that you can see it's not active i can't make coronals but just a curious uh accessory bronchus here's another one in which we have yeah. uh, curious vessels both arteries and veins in the right lung. So this is an incidental finding in a patient that Judy sent. So let me bring up the images of the lower lungs. Let's start down here. And first off here, we really haven't opacified the arteries. We've opacified the right heart. But here is an artery coming off the aorta. It has some mural calcifications. And that vessel goes into the right lower lobe and then we also see a tangle of some unusual pulmonary veins. So we have an arterial supply, systemic arterial supply there. And oops, let me try and pick up another one first to show you that there are some really strange vessels down here. And some of the big ones I'll show you in a moment are pulmonary veins. The other ones that are in the lung, I can't tell for sure whether they're unusual pulmonary veins or very small pulmonary veins that connect a bunch of larger pulmonary veins in the right lower lobe. And then we have this relatively big vein here going where it should to the left atrium here. And let me go back to the one I had up before to show you that we have some pulmonary veins in the right upper lobe here that connect to azygous vein. So they drain to the azygous vein. And then as we go superiorly, that azygous vein kind of peters out 
and I don't see it connecting as a normal azygous vein to the superior vena cava. Perhaps here it is relatively small. So we definitely have anomalous pulmonary venous drainage to azygous vein. And then you can see here's the azygous vein and it goes down here to become a, I guess a lumbar, ascending lumbar vein there. So a rather peculiar complex of arterial and venous anomalies in this right lung as an incidental finding. I didn't see any abnormalities of lobation to go along with that. So just a curious case of like a sequestration or at least systemic arterial supply and then anomalous pulmonary veins going to the azygous. Well, it looks like there's no hor uh, horizontal fissure in that case. Let's see, we have at least, what we have, let's see, we have. And you have a funny, upper lobe. the upper lobe is very odd looking. The funny bronchus there to the yeah, upper lobe a little bit. Missing, and it does, it's missing an anterior and posterior segment. And then there's no, you know, horizontal or minor fissure. So it kind of looks like a hybrid middle upper lobe, almost like a lingula. And a, okay. And this middle lobe bronchus is relatively big. Right. Looks like you've got some sagittals and coronals. Yeah, let's see. I don't, this, with these images that I get, I may not be able to, let's see if I can do, about trying to get lung windows out of this. So, some, yeah. These don't uh, window properly because of the way they are. What about the scanogram? This is a bedside radiograph. Hey, look how small the interlobar pulmonary artery is. Here. Yeah, it's it's a bit odd. Maybe there is some innovation abnormality. I'm sorry, I can't define that. Well, it's sort of like a scimitar variant without the scimitar. I think David had shown it like an almost scimitar a while ago that didn't quite make it to the IVC. Yeah, I think you're right. I think looking at the axials, I can't pick up what looks like a minor fissure. So there may be a combination here of the right upper and the right middle lobes together, two lobes with some unusual branching up here. I think you're absolutely right. That'll be your rule. Got to be an airway abnormality. That's right. Got to be an airway abnormality. You just have to find it. Sorry, I didn't uh, have a lot of time to uh, spend last night looking at the anatomy there. This is the third case that um, Julia shared with us. So this patient has a hepatocellular carcinoma. We see the tumor on these MRI exams. And then I will show you here that we have a lot of tumor in the liver. It involves the vena cava. And along with this big filling defect there, as I scroll up, you'll see a lot of undoubtedly tumor emboli and tumor in vessels in the lung. So they are both large and small. Here we have large ones on the left-hand side and we see more of the same, sorry about that, in other vessels. So the idea that we have very large intravascular tumor emboli and tumor growth, maybe metastatic disease involving lymph nodes as well. So in multiple locations like here and there are undoubtedly large intravascular tumor metastases growing in those vessels as well as other nodules, pretty bad. And this being tumor here. So hepatocellular carcinoma, IVC involvement, extensive metastatic disease, particularly involving vessels of the lung. And I think especially those peripheral ones that are really expanding the vessels more than you would expect for bland emboli. Yep, exactly. 
Let's see if I have a long window. I don't quite have a long window to show you. This may not work very well. I haven't quite figured out how to easily get these to display properly. So yeah, I think we'll leave it at that. And um, that's it, Jeff, for uh, Julie's cases. Thanks to Julie for those. And thanks for showing them. Sure. Do you have? Oh, I want to show one real fast. Can I show one real fast? Yeah, please do. Travis, uh, Travis will like this one. So a couple of weeks ago, I showed a case of necrotizing pneumonia from a Staphylococcus, and I showed Cheerios. And as things sometimes happen, we see cases like that in rapid succession. So. Here is another patient with necrotizing pneumonia. This is Staph aureus by blood culture. And let me bring up some thin cuts because in this patient too, um, I think I see Cheerios. So let me find a couple of Cheerios for you, like here. And I think I found two, maybe two or three little Cheerios, little areas of necrosis making Cheerios in this patient with necrotizing pneumonia. I think I saw maybe three or four total. Where was the other one? Maybe up here. But there were a couple, a couple of Cheerios as well in this patient. Howard, your case is also a yep. great example of interstitial gas. Yeah. It's a, both sides. Yeah. So it's we have really a lovely gamma Macklin phenomenon, right? Yeah. We have lightning bolts, the black lightning bolts of septal emphysema up there. We have subvisceral pleural interstitial edema in relation to the fissures, the pneumomediastinum. Um, absolutely right. So I ascribe that to the Macklin phenomenon. I couldn't find any really nice cuffs of air in relation to bronchovascular bundles, I don't think. There's <clears throat> there's a little bit of that on the right near the hilum, upper low, I Maybe think. Maybe I'm somewhere, Here, right. oh, here's one right here. I can point that one out with a little arrow, but here's a little air. It looks like that, that pulmonary vein just anterior on that same image right there as well. Let's have a look at some other ones. So, uh, there. Yeah, I want the air in places like this right here of that phenomenon. Yeah, sometimes the more you look at, the more you find. There's probably one I'm here, right? right there. Yep. Yep. So, let me see if I can find another, at least one other Cheerio. Did you buy this one, Travis? Here's a little Cheerio. Yeah, and these are frosted Cheerios. They got that little Oops. brown glass around them, which I think is usually yeah. in the setting of infection. Yep. And a couple of little ones up here too. Little areas of cavitation right up there. All right, Jeff, those are mine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. Next. I got cases. All righty. Uh, let's see if this will work. Uh, okay. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my stuff. So yeah, this is, we do. This is an interesting case. So this is one of the cooler cases I've seen in a while. It's a youngish woman. I can't remember twenties, uh, with shortness of breath and this x-ray, uh, if you guys do peds congenital heart disease, if you saw this chest x-ray in a newborn or someone who was a couple weeks old, I mean, this is, about the nicest snowman sign you'll ever see. Uh, and that's associated with supercardiac TAPVR. The issue with that is this is a 20 something year old woman and or woman and, and people that age don't live for 20 something else with undiscovered TAPVR. So this patient somehow went with the diagnosis based on the chest x-ray of TAPVR and then got a MRI and was called PAPVR, which is interesting because it's not PAPVR. So we'll see that there is this big hunking, if I can scroll, sorry, vein here. And it connects to the left brachiocephalic and, sorry, scrolls down. It goes almost like a left superior vena cava and it connects directly to the left atrium. 
So it's really not a PAPVR because it connects to the left atrium. Now, uh, this was done in Brazil, and they actually did 4D flow on it. And here we were able to reconstruct some of the 4D flow images. And here is this anomalous vein, central pulmonary vein. I'm not really sure. Um, but basically, what it was is that there was retrograde flow. So blood was coming into the left atrium and then going up from the left atrium in through this retrograde huge vessel and dumping into the uh, the brachius valve vein and going. So she was shunting and the shunt calculation was like four to one. So the vast majority of her blood was shunting away from her LV and going into the RV via this uh, vein. And then the question is, well, why was that happening? And there had to be some sort of obstruction because normally the blood would go from centrally from the central venous system into the left atrium and you would have a shunt the other direction. So the question is, why was that happening? And you can kind of see it here. Uh, son of a... One second. Kind of see it here. It almost looks like she has a mitral valve and then another mitral valve. But this is, she only has one mitral valve and there's this ring of tissue sitting here, um, which was better seen with uh, and I've been having trouble getting these to play, but was better seen with an echo that she had done. Let's see if this will work simply. Yeah, not great. Let's see if I can change this a little bit better. But what you can see is that here's her mitral valve opening, and then she has this restrictive cord tritriatum. And so she had a, uh, somehow had this, I don't know if it's a left-sided SVC draining into the left atrium. I don't know if it's a persistent cardinal vein. I'm not sure what exact, it's, it's not a pulmonary vein because it's, yeah. Anyways, we're, we're, no one's really sure what this is. There's one case report of this happening and they called it a le persistent left SVC draining into the left atrium. Whatever it is, it was basically because of the uh, corte atriatum, the majority of her blood was shooting up this huge, uh, vein and then bypassing her systemic circulation to recirculate into the pulmonary circulation, hence the massive RV and the findings of uh, fluid overload on the chest X-ray. So that was just a really so cool case. That, it, I can't tell um, in the MR, but it looks like the left lung drains into that vein. Is that? Yes. No. So there, there is pulmonary venous drainage into that. Yes. Okay. 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 No, there is. And that's why I initially, I called it, I was going to call it a, um, a, some sort of persistent cardinal vein, mm -hmm. or I'm not sure what. Yeah, that, I, I agree. I think it's a levoatrial cardinal vein. It's just yeah. huge. Because so, we saw one case report, they called it persistent left SVC, which I didn't buy because of this finding. But um, we were thinking going down the route of a, a, a levoatrial cardinal vein. But uh, and they so they've been calling her PBR, but it's really not. Or maybe no, and it, it just persisted because of the pressure in her left atrium, because of the because of the atriatum obstructing mm -hmm. significantly obstructing. It just stayed persistent. That's never, amazing. But and she really was healthy. She would run marathons. She was like a runner, and then all of a sudden she was like, I can only run like four miles now instead of like my usual, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, an echo. It, for me, I, mean, I can run like. Right? I can run 50 feet and get tired. I probably have. A, I probably yeah, you have. You probably a, have this, Seth. Exactly. Can you, can, this is my. This is my. Can you, can you guys explain the terminology to you? Why is this not uh, an almost pulmonary venous drainage? The pulmonary veins are going into this thing. And it's connected to the systemic circulation. But, but it is connected to the left atrium. It's connected to both, but the, the right. blood. So the, the blood both. is going. Up. So, so because of the high pressure on that left side, this blood is going into the systemic circulation. It's going upward into the brachycephalic and then uh, back to the right atrium, correct? Yes. I always think of, personally, I always think of anomalous pulmonary veins as having no direct connection to the left atrium and then hence finding an alternate route and directing and draining into the systemic circulation. So this uh, is an anomaly. This is an anomaly of the anomaly of partial anomalous then. Right. It's exactly. And I have the whole MR. It's just going to take forever to go through all the, uh, the images. But we have MRAs. We have, I'm trying to see, maybe there's a quick MRA. Here's a quick but one I can go. I think 
by definition though, David, it's because it's bi-directional right. rather than just an anomalous vein that only has one connection. And you could get to and fro flow in this, but the levoatrial vein, we see it sometimes in the congenital cases, and I know Seth has seen it just as a method of decompression when patients have some sort of LV or left-sided obstruction. That has, of course, that connects to the to the uh, left brachycephalic. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Levo, levo atrial cardinal vein. Okay. Yep. And typically, when one sees that, the blood flow is going uphill to the brachycephalic vein. That's the direction of flow because of the circumstances in which this usually occurs. Right. Yes. It often. And there are case reports of patients that have a persistent levoatrial cardinal vein that present with paradoxical emboli, which is thought to be due to Valsalvo or something that increases the venous pressure and then causes it to shift to a right to left shunt. And we can, yeah, we have some, I'll send all these data, but this shows like the, the actual directional, the flow showing the, um, anyways, and, and you can see via the arrows that it's going up and up and around. So it's just kind of a, I thought a really neat case. And then to, uh, is this, and then just a kind of a fun case that is, I saw on call that is a nice correlate is this case where if this person had, the re, you know, I actually blew by it. The resident was like, you know, what is this? Oh, it's nothing. And then I started looking at it and I'm like, well, obviously we shouldn't have calcification sitting in the left atrium. The left atrium is large. It has a slightly atypical morphology and went back and looked at the old Adam pelvis CT from a couple of years ago. He has other issues going on and you can see that it's a, if I can blow this up, maybe you can't see it, but here it is. So a little calcification here, linear, if I can get it to stop right here. So that I was like, oh, it's gotta be another cortrite triatum. And then sure enough, the patient had, let's see, a uh, echo. Well, so they had an echo a couple of years before, a couple of months before that showed that in fact, he also had a non-obstructive cortrite triatum. This one for some reason has some audio. So here's left ventricle, here's left atrium. And here is that band, which looked obstructive, but on echo, they said it was not obstructive. So just a random case of a kind of cortrate triatum with calcification of the fibrous tissue, fibrous band on non-con CT. Uh, I don't remember what this case is. Let's see what this case is. I would really quickly just go. And this is a cool case. Uh, we've seen a bunch of these now, but just a nice example of someone who came in with lung cancer and then also had all these little tiny nodules here in the lower lobes. Um, some of them, if you look close enough, maybe a little central Cheerio. Uh, most of them are not. Most of them appear solidish, but some of them may be. Uh, what's interesting is we have abdominal pelvic studies going back to 2008. And there's a couple of abdomen pelvis studies. She came in with like ER with appendicitis and they weren't there uh, back then or really maybe, uh, you know, maybe one or two. But anyway, she underwent their, her lung cancer resection and these were minute meningo endothelial like nodules um, and proven on the, uh, the right upper lobe. It took out the right upper lobe and the right middle lobe. Uh, so just a, a, another one of these cases of minute meningo endothelial like pulmonary nodules. Um, and we have been certain, you know, some people have been calling it METS, uh, but they had been, even though they were new since the 2008 study, they were unchanged over uh, many years. And just another case of that. Oh, this case. Oh, I forgot about this case. This case is actually one of the cooler cases I've seen in a while. This is the last one. Let me do this real quick. So this is a guy who has a cardiac mass noted on echo um, and had a abdomen pelvis CT from a while ago, which shows the cystic mass with some that's kind of compressing the coronary sinus. 
uh, and it started filling with contrast. And one of these is earlier, and one of these is more delayed. And you can see on one of the more delayed phases that it is even more so filled with contrast. And we have a beautiful MR. I won't waste people's time on it because it's kind of running late, but let me see if I can. So here is this very, on T1, uh, kind of high, slightly high intense, but relatively ISO intense to liver. Let me see if I can find the T2. The T2 is really uh, impressive. That's a T1. That's a grid. I don't know why they did that. Um, yeah, where's the T2? Anyways, this is a, the only case I've ever seen of like, and here's a, a very delayed T1 post. And then we have studies going over multiple, multiple um, uh, T1 posts showing this lesion filling in slowly and slowly. So this was, uh, this is a cardiac hemangioma. And I, I've never seen one personally. Uh, this is the first one I've seen uh, at an institution I've been at. So is he post biopsy? What? He had sternal wires there. Yeah, they took out a they they re, they took out a little piece of it, and uh, they left it alone after that. So uh, maybe a capillary hemangioma. Yeah, I have to look at the path to see exactly what yeah. they. I mean, it's hemangioma. I, I know that. I, I just yes. don't know exactly what they called it on path. I'm sorry, I'm shooting through these. Not very helpful, but I was really looking for the T2s because it's quite it's quite pretty on the T2s. Because uh, you can see the the lobulation here. This maybe maybe oh, these are kind of not these are T two ish, but these are really T twos. But you can see all the lobulations in it. This is about as close to a T two as I have. Uh, but anyways, I, I've just not really seen one before, and it was really uh, a nice case, especially on the abdominal study, seeing it fill in over time, and on the on the coronary or the MRI here. So, anyway, those are those are what I got. What will they do with that? I mean, it seems to Nothing. me uh, kind of a bulky lesion, lesion to leave there. Nothing at all. So they, they've been, it's a very soft lesion. Uh, yeah. Here is uh, cardiac, or here's his regular. He has like, I can't remember what he has. He has a form of uh, cancer uh, okay. unrelated to this. And they're following it up with just non con CTs because they're predominantly following the cancer. And okay. they're, you know, they're not doing anything with it. All right. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. All righty. Who's next? Travis, David? I can try. Okay. Or whoever, it doesn't matter. I've got two quickies. Okay, hold on. Uh, we'll change it to Godwin here. All right. Please close confidential windows. Okay. So. Can people see a rentgenogram? <clears throat> Good. This is a 19-year-old woman with an EBV-related um, syndrome, and she had a lot of muscle aches and back pain and stuff like that. She had a chest radiograph. She didn't have a positive mono test, but she was uh, considered to have mononucleosis, and I think they did find EBV somewhere in her body. And she has this radiograph with a irregular nodule here in the left apex. Um, which is confirmed on CT. It's got a nodular component here and then some less intense consolidation nearby and maybe a second nodule at this level. And um, this was this persisted for several months. Um, here it is about three months later. And then uh, she was, there was a, um, a biopsy of this thing that disclosed uh, some sort of a round yeast form that they consider as cryptococcus. The cultures never grew cryptococcus, but this is the Northwest. We have cryptococcus here. It was considered unlikely to be blasto or histo. So they're going with cryptococcus and they don't, you know, since they don't have it cultured and they don't have PCR, we don't know whether it's neoformans or gadii. And here's a recent uh, CT scan several months out and you can see that it's now a more discreet lesion and the adjacent lesions have pretty much gone away so this was treated uh, with I think oral antifungals for a long time I think fluconazole is what they use for this so cryptococcus presumably given its uh, pathologic appearance mm -hmm. and uh, the lack of exposure to uh, other things and then 
she's considered to have some sort of immune deficiency. People consider whether it's CVID, she has that in her family, but it doesn't fit all the criteria. Um, so this, she has a lot of systemic issues all over the place. She's got a lot of lymphadenopathy, which uh, is persisting here, but was more impressive before. Let me show you this earlier scan with the lymphadenopathy here in the mediastinum. See quite a bit of, quite a few nodes up here, sort of sarcoid-like, fairly sharply defined lymph nodes in the mediastinum and so forth. So, and at 19, she still has thymus legitimately. So lymphadenopathy, uh, she has abdominal lymphadenopathy as well on CT scans that included her abdomen and some sort of bizarre immune deficiency and cryptococcus in that setting. Okay, um, now <clears throat> this is a case of a woman persistently messy looking lungs, somewhat worse in the mid lungs than bases. And uh, this has gone on for a long time. She has a diagnosis that goes back to 2011. So the diagnosis was made many years ago. And this is what CT looks like in her. And this, in, we get more and more lung diseases as we go down to the bases. And she has um, nodule down here. And this nodule has been there for many, many years. She has a series of nodules, and she had um, a biopsy of one of these nodules. And um, Howard is going to tell us what the biopsy showed. Howard? Um, Notice that there are some, there are probably some, I think there's some bright elements in this, unless I'm just dealing with edge artifact here. I'll have to so look at this. Protein. Protein. MLS. Yes. Protein, amyloid, or non-amyloid. Mm -hmm. So they found uh, plasma cells in this, and there was some um, light chain restriction. I don't know whether it was a KRL. I'll get that information. And this is uh, AL amyloidosis. And the clinical setting for her is a history of um, Sjogren's syndrome, autoimmune hepatitis, and the biopsy of this nodule. Um, she had marginal zone lymphoma and mostly amyloid. So the nodule is mostly amyloid, <clears throat> but there was marginal zone lymphoma there too. And she received uh, a few rounds of treatment for amyloid and lymphoma, including CAR T cell therapy in, in January. Hmm. So wow. this is amyloidosis in the lungs with um, cysts. I, I, when I saw this case, I thought, Howard definitely wants to see this case. That's cool. So, Very and the background of Sjogren's syndrome, clinical Sjogren's syndrome? Sjogren's syndrome and autoimmune hepatitis, right. Autoimmune hepatitis. Okay. All right. Now, Travis. Thank you, David. All right. I quickly pulled up this radiographics article from 2001, looking back at these bronchial abnormalities for Howard's case. And I think this diagram right here shows what your case is, Howard. So oh, if I remember what you just showed, I think it's number six. Ah. Oh. So okay. Pre-hyparterial. So it's below the pulmonary artery. I don't know why it's pre though. That doesn't make much sense. It seems like it should be post, but I don't know. I think it's one of these. And, and Travis, so I think this, yeah. that paragraph to the left of it highlights what I mentioned earlier, where they refer to tracheal bronchus, including arising from a main bronchus, hence the 1% of left tracheal bronchi, but it's not a tracheal bronchus. Yeah. So uh, this yeah. is an article that's easy to get from Google if you want to read more. Great, yeah, number six, thank you. Yeah, just call it a number six in the report. <laughs> <laughs> this case, that, I, great. This ca case I had in the bullpen for days that were slower, but since Seth showed that case of the levoatrial cardinal vein, I figured I'd pull this one up. It's one of the better examples of what I've seen of this minor abnormality, which we see all the time. And you can see there's this extra 
vertical opacity adjacent to the aorta, not obscuring the aortic arch. And it's been visible on a couple of radiographs that this patient's had. Arguably, this one's a little bit more subtle, the older radiograph. But this just turns out to be a, an anomalous pulmonary vein in the left upper lobe, uncomplicated PAPVR. So this is one of those ones that, you know, just occasionally I think we can see them on radiographs. And I just saved that one because I thought it was such a good example of being visible on a radiograph as this vertical vein here. Very nice. And this yes. does not connect to uh, left atrium. Correct. This is typical PAPVR of the left superior pulmonary vein. Just going straight up. All right. Now this one is for Seth because I know he said he misses all of these congenital heart cases. And this is one that just came in yesterday and it's along the same theme. But I'm going to start inferiorly and this this is a three-day-old, and you can see there's an umbilical venous catheter. There's an umbilical arterial catheter, too, which is in the aorta. And this is pretty cool right here, because it almost looks like you have a double aorta sandwiching the esophagus. But as you scroll up, you will see that this is where the pulmonary veins drain, and you have no communication to the left atrium here. When we count the pulmonary veins, though, you'll see there's one, the left superior, and then both inferior pulmonary veins. And the right pulmonary vein is not accounted for there. But you see up here, the right superior pulmonary vein is draining into the superior vena cava. So there you know, are numerous different types of total anomalous pulmonary venous return. But in this case, this is a mixed type. And this is the first time I think I've seen a mixed one where you have the all three or three of the pulmonary veins draining inferiorly and it's going into the hepatic portion of the IVC right here, and then a right superior PAPVR up here. So they went and repaired this yesterday, and they, for now, they left the right superior pulmonary vein alone just because it was a different approach, but just connected these back to his left atrium where they should be. A couple of other things that are interesting in this case is you notice that the umbilical venous catheter ends up in the left atrium. And there was some debate, and we're still not sure because I haven't seen the final operative report, of whether this is a sinus venosus ASD or a secundum ASD. And they just said they had an atrial septal defect that they repaired, uh, which was associated with this. But then also, I think it's really cool, just the physiology of the patent ductus in this case. Because you can see here is the ascending aorta, here's the descending aorta, and you can see the difference in contrast. And that's, of course, because you have this huge PPA from the where you have contrast clearly going from the pulmonary artery into the descending aorta, indicative or indicated by the fact that you have more contrast in the descending aorta here than you do in the ascending. So, Seth, you've seen mixed type before, like this. One. One. So. Very, very common, but that's that's really cool. It's got to be an inferior sinus spinosis, because, right? I mean, I mean, there has to be an ASD for survival. Uh, right. And the, the septum looks intact. It's a great, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. I, I don't know that the pre op echo just said ASD versus PFO, and I don't have the final op report yet. I'll let you know. Yeah. So, cool. Travis, how many veins are going into that um, that posterior entity? Is it, did you Three. say the left superior and inferior? And yes. The right superior? Correct. So, the right inferior, there's the left inferior, here's the left superior. Yeah. And then the right superior is going into the SVC. And he was obstructed at the at the uh, portal of confluence, right? Because, uh, I mean, it looks tight yeah. there. What? Yeah, it looks pretty tight there, too. So and to, to edematous or? I don't know. I don't know. He's pretty down, huh? It doesn't look that bad. And this was not picked up prenatally, either. Interesting. So it was... At birth, he was like satting 78% and never got better, and they discovered this. Now, here's another one, and Seth, I'm glad you're back for this case, because this is bizarre, too. This is a patient who is an older patient, and you can see they have bilateral pleural effusions. And you can tease out here that they have pericardial calcification. Nice example of just circumferential pericardial calcification, and certainly Whenever you have effusions, and these were chronic effusions, you start to think, does this patient have constriction in the setting of 
calcification? And the answer is yes, he does. And this was confirmed with right and left heart cath. But what's really interesting is the, the appearance of his pericardium and his pericardial fluid. I've never seen this before, but it essentially looks like caseous fluid. This is not enhancement and not contrast in there. Here's the calcification. And then you just have this milky fluid in his pericardium. And he has these tubularized ventricles. He's got a contrast fluid level dilated IVC. And just check out you know, the look of that fluid in there. Hmm. They went and stripped this. I'll show you just a four chamber. It's not the best ventricular dependence, but there's certainly some rocking of the septum here. And you can see that kind of fixed anterior. Well, it's not even an RV free wall that's fixed, but the pericardium definitely looks like it's preventing re-expansion here or expansion of the RV. But when they took him to surgery, they found that there was a bunch of cloudy, milky fluid in there. And this guy didn't have any history of infection, but I was guessing this might be mycobacterial or, or old TB or something. And unfortunately, they didn't send it for mycobacterial cultures for some reason, but none of the other cultures grew anything. His PPD was negative, and I talked to the ID folks afterwards. But what's interesting is the biopsy came back, or the, the pericardial uh, biopsy from the surge path came back as all pericardial amyloid. And I don't have the actual report because it was a VA case, but it was, it was amyloid throughout the pericardium, and there's no amyloid in his heart itself which was kind of interesting. You know, you can see the pericardial enhancement. There's a little less in the blood pool, but there's nothing in the, in the myocardium itself to suggest that he has myocardial amyloid, I don't think. Um, and I've never seen or heard of that. I did manage to find a case report. And again, I don't know if this is just maybe due to an infection that we're missing, like old TB. I'm curious what you guys think, but this is basically what they saw in our pathology. And this is, yes, a very old case report. Hmm. I mean, yeah, if not, that's pretty cool. That's really up. Uh, yeah, I just. I'm, I'm biopsy. Well, it was, it was when they did the pericardial stripping. It was just whatever they, piece of pericardium or pieces they took out. It was just filled with amyloid. Uh, how old is he? 70. Oh, so, uh, huh? Yeah, I don't know. That's really they may or may not do, but it would be kind of curious to try to see if they can identify the substrate of the amyloid. What's the constituent protein? It's peculiar. Yeah, I just wonder if the amyloid is a reaction to some infection that he's had in the past, because he doesn't have a connective tissue disease. He doesn't have, he's never had radiation or surgery or anything else that would explain why he has chronic pericarditis and pericardial calcification and constriction. Wow. All right, Jeff, I'll stop there. Okay. All right, let's see. I've got, got a few here. Not as exciting, but let's see. Um, well, this is a, a, a nice companion case. Uh, I believe it was Howard showed, or someone showed a desmoid a few weeks ago. I think it was Howard. And this is just another example of one here. I'll show it on the you can see there's this soft tissue mass, well circumscribed, which is a little unusual. They're often more infiltrative in there, um, in the posterior uh, soft tissues, the fat just above the paraspinal muscles. And uh, let's see if I can, is there one higher up too? I think there may have been two in this one. Yeah, and then there's this one here. Sporadic desmoid? Yeah, as far as I know, I have to dig her out. I just found it this morning. So yeah, David showed one a few weeks ago. That's right. Yeah, and you can see this one. This one here is not so well circumscribed and involves the um, the trapezius there. And you can see on the this is a T1 fat mat. Um, it's got pretty high signal intensity there. Here's a stir, also high signal intensity. Um, and here's the gadolinium. So. You know, that you can, I think what this shows nicely is sort of the infiltrative nature of these. It almost looks like a lung cancer and that they're very speculative. And these have a high rate of recurrence um, locally because there's often little threads of these cells. I don't want to say, they're not really neoplastic, but um, these desmoid cells running out in the fiber. So it's hard to get a really good margin um, and they're challenging to treat. Um, but they see the ones I've all seen have been in the anterior chest wall. This one has to be posterior, but they often are 
seem to be very close to a lot of the chest wall muscles. So this is another variant. And this also was a woman, which is typically the, what we see them in. Um, this is a cool case. Um, this is a patient who had a six-year-old patient who had an allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, several years ago for leukemia and has known uh, chronic GVHD uh, related manifesting as constrictive bronchiolitis. So you can see uh, there is some heterogeneity of the lungs. I don't have expiratory images, but ha had some airflow obstruction. You can see, I'll make the windows a little, you know, little contrast here. So I had this no um, air trapping, which is a manifestation of GVHD. But what was, what's interesting is, and I'll show three coronals. Let's do this. Get them all three display. We got two of them, let's see. So this is 2017, this is 2015, is what's going on upstairs. It's these progressive and development of and then progression of these peripheral areas of peribronchial fibrosis. Um, and you can see there's going all the way out to the pleural surface. I'll show the axial. This is the uh, most recent one here. And um, 2017 was here. So these have been progressing along, and not a whole lot of change between these two years. But then I'll show the axials again. Uh, oh, uh, let's see. Here we go. And you can see the mosaic attenuation really nice on this scan. And then you see this all this peripheral consolidation with volume loss and distortion. So uh, suggestive of pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis, uh, which is a, another known manifestation of chronic GVHD. And indeed, this patient's had obstructive physiology that started to begin to normalize a little bit um, as there's development of more restriction, but the lung volumes were becoming smaller and the um, the DLCO was down further, which which would fit this. So it's sort of a another, you know, like a, analogous to a CPFE where you have fibrosis and, and emphysema and presumably some airway. In this case, we have small airways disease and parenchymal fibrosis. And you see this just extra thickening here. So presumably all related to chronic graft versus host disease. And I've got about three different uh, time points so you can see this. I do have some expiratory images just to show the air trapping really nicely. So, you know, Jeff, I've not seen this before with um, GVHD, this upper mid and upper lung scarring pattern that looks like chronic rejection in a lung transplant. Have you seen this in other cases? Of we have. GVHD? We have, and it has been described, and, he, and it made me think yeah. about it. The fact is that we see this with lung transplant, where you have, is probably host versus graft disease. Right. And this is graft versus host disease, but it's probably the same phenomenon. It's lymphocytes or whatever attacking lung and causing just as, injury. Just as the constrictive bronchiolitis is the mirror image of the right. lung transplant. And, you know, that restrictive allograft syndrome with the transplants is becoming more recognized. Um, so it's... And we probably missed it for years and uh, just call it scarred. And we didn't have a lot of serial imaging, but um, it's a small, it's something like 10% of the chronic rejections, which just seems higher than what I'm used to seeing. But uh, yeah. we've seen this a few times in GBHD, and I, I suspect it's the exact same mechanism. It's lymphocytes attacking lung, causing injury. It just depends on whose lymphocytes and whose lung. Yeah. But yeah exactly the same complication but yeah we don't have tissue on this but and there's really no good reason to um but so hopefully tr aggressive treatment of the gvhd will help protect uh, help with this but clearly it's progressing faster than the obstructive component hence the change in pulmonary function test this is yeah. my cool case you guys will like this one for those of you at str this was a fresh case that came through yesterday so this Wait is a woman in her, I forget, um, how was, she's 50, and has known skin abnormality, a bunch of skin lesions, all these little red blistery things, these little ulcerative craters. I've got a whole bunch of pictures. I've got a oral, there's a nasal ulcer, there's oral ulcers. Um, you got all these cutaneous ones um, okay. everywhere, so badness. And then I showed you quickly her radiograph, but you can see there's numerous tiny nodules and a dominant nodule here. And so if you were paying attention to Daniela's lecture uh, on yesterday, we know skin and lung is in this, and she's from uh, the mid right around here, is consistent with blastomycosis. So we prove it's not. The CT doesn't really add anything. It just 
confirms what we already know, shows miliary nodules in a random distribution, a dominant nodule. But key points that Daniela made is we don't see pleural effusion and we don't see lymphadenopathy. So that also points away from histo uh, with the lymphadenopathy and away from um, a bacterial infection, which you expect to see effusion more likely. So this is blasto. What's interesting is she works in a, uh, a thrift shop. So she has no known exposures, but given that it's February and it, the ground's been near frozen for a couple months, this is probably, uh, the she probably had a subclinical, you know, infectious pneumonia, which may be what that big nodule is the remnant of right here that then disseminated, that she got in the fall, who knows where, um, that then disseminated and the skin is often a later presentation, extra, extra pulmonary disease is often a later presentation. And then it's now disseminated through the bloodstream and back in her lungs again. Surprisingly, she doesn't have a ton of pulmonary symptoms. She's doing quite well. They have her on uh, um, appropriate treatment. I think she's going to be on IV something for a while and then they'll get her on orals, but she'll need treatment for at least a year to clear this up. But they biopsied the skin lesions and found blasto in it. My goodness. Yeah. So the, the other case of miliary blasto we had was in a guy that Daniela had in her lecture who was a bunch of his friends also got exposed and he refused treatment, came back late. He got better and then he came back later with disseminated blasto, but he developed ARDS and died. So that's one of the concerns. Um, but she's she's doing well and is responding. So, but yeah, this is this is the worst case of cutaneous blasto I've ever seen. The ones I've seen have had one or two lesions but she has almost as many as she does in the lungs. She seemed to have a few vesicles, but the others look much nastier. They began yeah. to ulcerate. Right? Yeah. The one on the nose, let me see if I can find a picture. Um, like on the nose with a little crusty, that's very typical. They, they tend to crater <laughs> and ulcer. You know, why she's got some in the, I mean, everywhere. It's pretty impressive. So how, you can have fun with that one. And then uh, just to wrap up, this is just a nice case, um, pretty classic case. Uh, this is a lady with pulmonary hypertension. You look at her radiographs, and to be honest, they're a little underwhelming, maybe a little bit generous pulmonary artery. But um, you know, interesting in that I have old imaging. And Seth, who knows, you may you may come across her at some point. She's got acute PE a year ago, um, you know, right heart strain, uh, but no signs of pulmonary. I mean, it's a little, maybe a little thick in there. So who knows if she had pre-existing disease, but clearly had an acute episode then. Was treated, uh, you know, there's a little narrow. Special aneurysm there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right there. Look at that. So acute right heart strain, but you make, makes you kind of wonder if she had some pre-existing clot and this was, she was referred to us with pulmonary hypertension. So this is done here and you can see indeed she has quite a thick RV free wall, um, large right atrium bowing of the atrial, interatrial septum. And then you can see she's got some webs here and the hardest thing to appreciate is the absent areas. So if you look at yeah. the, here's the upper lobe and you can see it's just a tight, area and there's really no anterior segment it's just gone in very little contrast and what's nice is i got the vq scan to go with it um, which shows that anterior defect right there matching the vq the uh the ct so a couple peripheral it's not as bad as i thought it would be usually i see um larger defects but clearly it's not normal normal ventilation so she's a she's a, a nice example of a ctef with pulmonary uh, well, ctef with really nice pulmonary hypertension and I don't know what her pressure are, but yeah. Go back to the axial CT lung window just to oh, yeah. the field to see. Yep, you're right. And some pretty uh, mosaic attenuation, yeah. not great. Yeah. I think this is the, the this, there's some couple peripheral opacities, which I think are just remnants of an infarct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see, you know, it's funny, we see that all the time. And um, everyone gets concerned there can't, like someone on the outside or someone wherever calls it cancer. Because some of these, you know, CTAP patients come in and they have these peripheral, just conglomerate scars. Yeah. And, and people just, they're like, oh, can't exclude cancer. And then people want us to buy, you know, want to biopsy. It's, it's, but it's from old infarcts. Hey, Jeff, Jeff, can you go back to the original CT really quick? Yeah. The interatrial septum, it looked like an atrial septal aneurysm, but was there a PFO as well? Um, it doesn't look like it. I would expect to see a little jet of contrast in here. And from the yeah. echo, it sounds like no. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I think this would, yeah, that's yeah. Big. Yeah, so she was treated with thrombolysis at this time. But, you know, just in looking at it today, it makes you wonder right here if this was pre existing chronic PE. Some of it looks so 
I, I agree. Some of it just looks so peripheral and like it's... Uh, like look right here. It almost looks like there's a web where the clot got yes. stuck. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We had it before. Yeah. And some of that stuff anteriorly in the right main pulmonary artery that's yeah. more eccentric. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, so sort of acute on chronic that went worse. So I don't know. So yeah, she's being evaluated for potential. I don't know if she'll be a good candidate. I mean, it's I don't. It's it's low bar, so she may she might be. I'm sure they'll at least see her down in Seth's place at some point. All right, thanks guys. Travis, or, or, uh, Jeff, throw it to my screen real quick. Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. Travis, I was just going to show because I knew I had a case similar to that, but it's not amyloid, but it has that uh, that layering gunk. In the pericardium nice you know and in other areas too and we were wondering the same thing as it was some of those sort of caseous necrosis kind of stuff but we have no path that's fascinating that you had amyloid on that that's you think that's, is that milk of calcium seth i don't even know what to call it i mean it, it could be milk uh, i mean what is milk of calcium i, I don't even it's yeah what so, i mean is, it, is that an imaging finding or is that like an actual I'm asking. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a liquid that has a bunch of very small calcium crystals in it, so that they can sort of settle out and stuff like that. Form. A, I mean, there is a line. There is more dense fluid when he lies posteriorly. Um, but it was just so, kind of a, when I saw Travis' case, I'm like, I've seen something like that. But uh, Travis, I've seen a case that looked like yours that it had this uh, you know intermediate density of gunk between calcified layers of of uh, pericardium. And that was remote tuberculosis. So okay. I thought your case really looked like the case I remember. This but, was, yeah, this was TB. This was known TB. Yeah. Okay, that's what I told the infectious disease team. They were just incredulous that they hadn't actually sent it for mycobacterial cultures and such. But uh, just anyways, uh, and you can see the nice constriction here in the RV. Anyways, but that, that just reminded me of that case. All right, guys, thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.